The Medical Knowledge Corporation presents the Patient's Guide to Lumbar Spine Surgery. This video presentation will answer the most common questions presented by patients who are considering lumbar spine surgery. We will review the process you have undergone thus far to reach this stage in your treatment. We will inform you what to expect after your surgical procedure and we will provide you with instructions for your recovery. Please review this presentation thoroughly, along with the information and instructions given to you by your surgeon as you take the next steps toward a healthy lifestyle. Before we discuss the operative procedure itself, let us review the process by which you and your surgeon have taken to decide that surgery may be indicated for your condition. Let's meet James, who has experienced many of the same challenges that you have. James remembers that simply bending over was an agonizing experience. My back pain was making life miserable. My work was suffering. I even had to give up things I enjoyed, like fishing with my son. Common symptoms associated with low back pain can be one or all of the following. Pain in and around the low back region. Pain in your legs, which can extend below the knee. Numbness and or weakness in your legs and feet bladder and bowel control problems. These debilitating symptoms can appear suddenly from a related accident as they did with James, or they can occur gradually over time from degenerative or arthritic conditions. However, when they occur, we know how miserable they can be and how important it is for you to resolve them. That's why you may have gone through a number of tests and exams to best determine the cause of your pain and how to remedy it. A quick review of the lower back, or lumbar spine anatomy, will give you a better understanding of your condition. The lumbar spine is made up of five large bones, called vertebrae, or vertebral bodies, and your tailbone, which consists of the sacrum and the coccyx. Each vertebral body is separated by the disc, which acts like a shock absorber. This area of your spine carries the majority of your body's weight which accounts for the larger size of the vertebral bodies in this region. The natural curve of this part of your lumbar spine is called a lordotic curve or lordosis, which also helps support the weight of your body. Starting from the sacrum, which is referred to as S1, and moving up towards the head, the lumbar vertebral bodies are referred to as L5 through L1. The spinal cord runs down behind the vertebral bodies of your spine and ends around L1, forming a bundle of nerves called the cauda equina, which continues down through the sacrum. The spinal cord and cauda equina are surrounded by bone and extends from the vertebral bodies and forms an arch from behind, which is called the lamina. The bone that extends back from the vertebral body and connects to the lamina is called the pedicle. The nerve roots exit the spinal canal on both sides and at each level. These nerve roots control the muscle's actions and also give sensation to your legs and pelvis. The spine is surrounded by many soft tissues that include muscles, ligaments, tendons, and fatty tissues. Now that you have a basic understanding of your lumbar spine's anatomy and the symptoms that have occurred, let's review the methods used in diagnosing your condition. Like James, you started with a thorough physical exam by your surgeon, and then you may have had one or all of the following tests performed. X-rays. X-rays show the bony structures of the spine. They can be the first step in determining any irregularities that may be causing problems. Dynamic x-rays, which include flexion and extended bending, may also be helpful in detecting abnormal motion between your vertebrae. MRI and CAT scans show both the bones and the soft tissues surrounding the spine and can help diagnose things such as disc herniations and bone spurs. These images are often used in conjunction with x-rays. An EMG nerve conduction velocity study these tests may determine the extent of any nerve damage you may have. A myelogram places a special dye in your spinal sac to highlight any compression on a nerve which may be causing your symptoms. This study is usually followed by a CAT scan. 
A discogram places a special die into a disc to help determine where your pain is coming from and analyzes the structure and integrity of the disc itself. One or any combination of these diagnostic tests, along with your physical exam, assists your doctor in accurately diagnosing your condition and in recommending the best course of action to be taken for your recovery. James wasn't surprised to hear his diagnosis of spinal stenosis. I knew it had to be more than a pulled muscle. When the doctor told me I had bone spurs that were pressing against the nerves in my lower back, it made sense. Once they found the problem, I just wanted to get it fixed. Like many patients, you may have gone through a conservative treatment approach first. Conservative treatments include physical therapy and rehabilitation in conjunction with medications such as anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, or epidural injections. In many cases, this may be all a patient needs to return back to his or her normal routine. In other cases, a patient, like James, may have to stop conservative treatment early or skip conservative treatment altogether and proceed with surgery as the only alternative for recovery. Like James, you have been diagnosed with a condition that requires surgical intervention as the next step. This condition can be one or more of the following. Disc herniation. A disc herniation occurs when the structural integrity of the disc has been damaged. Typically, the damaged disc places pressure on either the cauda equina or the nerve roots, which branch off from the cauda equina. Disc herniations may be caused by sudden trauma to the lower back or by repetitive stress to the area. Spondylosis. Spondylosis is a condition where bone spurs form around the disc space, nerve roots, and or the cauda equina. Smoking and frequent or repetitive lifting of heavy objects are risk factors for this degenerative condition. Spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is the narrowing or constriction of bony passages that surround nerve roots and or the cauda equina. Spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis is a forward displacement of one vertebral body over another. Spinal instability. Spinal instability is the general laxity of one or more of the bony structures and associated soft tissues of the spine. These conditions in the lumbar spine can cause pressure on the nerve roots. This pressure on the nerve roots and its associated symptoms are called radiculopathy. Radiculopathy can cause pain, numbness, and or weakness which may extend down into your legs. Any of these conditions in the lumbar spine can also cause pressure on the cauda equina, which is called myelopathy. Myelopathy can cause pain in the low back region and the legs, as well as weakness and stiffness in the extremities and or a loss of bowel and bladder control. Any or all of the conditions in the lumbar spine may require surgical intervention. The goal of the surgery is to accomplish three main objectives. Reduction, which is restoring the spine back to its natural alignment. Decompression is the removal of disc material or bone spurs that are pressing on the nerve roots and or spinal cord. Stability, which refers to stabilizing segments of the spine, usually through fusion, which eliminates unwanted motion. One or a combination of these three objectives may be performed during your surgery to help eliminate the symptoms described earlier. James was at first reluctant to have surgery, but remembers what life was like before his injury and wants to get back to his normal way of life. He was confident that his doctor had thoroughly explored every avenue of diagnosis and treatment. Anytime you hear the word surgery, you get nervous, but after I had spoken with my doctor, I realized that it was the best way for me to get my life back on track. Like James, you have reached the point where your surgeon recommends that a surgical procedure is the best option in treating your low back or lumbar spine problem. Before your surgery date, you may be asked to visit the hospital for some routine lab work. This visit is a short one and ensures that the hospital, the anesthesiologist, and your surgeon have a complete medical profile to prevent possible complications during the surgical procedure and to make your hospital stay more enjoyable. 
You may also meet your anesthesiologist and other medical personnel at the hospital before your procedure to further educate you about your hospital stay. Remember to always follow specific instructions given to you by your surgeon and hospital prior to your surgical procedure. The following instructions are what you may expect. Discontinue any medications as instructed by your physician prior to surgery. Discontinue all nicotine products because nicotine may slow down the healing process and increase the risk of a failed fusion. Limit your vitamin intake to a multivitamin. Eliminate alcohol consumption to further avoid surgical complications. Please remember, with any surgical procedure, complications may occur. These complications may include infection, pain, weakness, numbness, advanced degeneration above and below the operative level, paralysis, loss of bowel and bladder control and sexual function, stroke, death, anesthetic risks, blood clots, damage to nerves and blood vessels, broken implanted hardware, and a failed fusion. Some devices used in spinal surgery may not be FDA approved for certain spinal applications. If you choose to have donated bone, you risk the chance of contracting AIDS or hepatitis. If you use your own pelvis bone, there is a risk of infection, fracture at the graft site, hematoma, numbness of the leg, and chronic pain at the graft site. Some of these risks may lead to the need for additional surgery. This list may not be all-inclusive, and, as with any aspect of your surgery, all questions should be fully discussed with your surgeon before your consent for surgery is given. Nevertheless, thousands of these procedures are done each year as a highly effective way to correct lumbar spine disorders with good success. There are many surgical options your surgeon may choose to best accomplish the goals necessary for a successful outcome. Your surgeon can approach the lumbar spine by two different methods, depending on your specific problem. The first approach is from the front of the lumbar spine. This is called an anterior approach, or an ALIF, which stands for Anterior Lumbar Interbody Fusion. A general surgeon may team up with your surgeon to help in this approach. The surgeon will make a small incision along the front of the abdomen and move internal structures over to expose your lumbar spine. Once the spine is exposed, the surgeon can remove part of or the entire affected disc, thereby relieving pressure on the nerve roots and or cauda equina. Once the disc is removed, your surgeon may perform a fusion of two or more of the lumbar vertebral bodies in your low back to stabilize this area. In a fusion, the disc is replaced with bone from either your pelvis or donor bone from a bone bank, either of which allows the two vertebrae on either side of the disc space to fuse together and become one. This in turn makes your spine more stable. Sometimes a device, referred to as a cage, is filled with either type of bone and placed within the disc space. Whether a cage device filled with bone or a specially shaped piece of bone alone is used, both methods add to further stabilizing your lumbar spine through fusion. For some patients, the surgeon may decide that a posterior approach is preferred. In a posterior approach, the surgeon exposes the lumbar region from the back. This approach allows the surgeon to perform a lumbar laminectomy, a type of decompression where he removes part or all of the bony arch covering the cauda equina and nerve roots, creating more room and thereby allowing the surgeon to remove any existing abnormalities. In some instances, the decompression is all a patient needs to accomplish the surgical goals. However, if your surgeon feels your spine requires additional stabilization, a fusion is performed. There are three different types of fusion procedures that can be performed from a posterior approach. These are a posterior lateral fusion, a PLIF, posterior lumbar interbody fusion, or a TLIF, transferaminal lumbar interbody fusion. In a posterior lateral fusion, bone is placed on the sides of the spine, allowing the vertebrae to fuse together, thereby eliminating any abnormal motion which could cause pain. 
In some patients, more stability is needed, requiring the surgeon to perform a PLIF or a TLIF. With these techniques, the disc is removed by a laminectomy. Then bone or cages are placed into the disc space to add greater stability and support to the spine while the fusion takes place. Instrumentation, including pedicle screws and rods, may be used to complement each of these techniques and to help achieve fusion and stability. In other cases, the patient may have a combination of both an anterior procedure and a posterior procedure, sometimes on the same day or staged a few days apart. Once the procedure is completed and after you leave the hospital, much of the success of your recovery relies on your commitment to follow your surgeon's postoperative instructions, which may include the following. Take care of your incision by keeping the area clean and applying ointment once or twice a day to help prevent infection. Avoid swimming or bathing for at least four weeks after surgery. Wear any brace you have been given as instructed. You may shower four to seven days after the procedure. Please remember to avoid all nicotine products. Call your surgeon's office immediately. If your incision develops redness or drainage, you develop a high fever in the first few days after surgery, you have an increase in pain, numbness, weakness, or swelling in the legs, you have any questions regarding your surgeon's instructions. If any emergency condition develops, dial 911 on the telephone or go immediately to your local hospital emergency room. Your postoperative care is an investment for a full and successful recovery. Just remember that this is a team effort and your part is just as important to your recovery as your surgeons. Also remember that a positive attitude will enhance your results. I finally feel like I can get my life back to normal. No one should have to live with that kind of discomfort when there's such a positive way of taking care of it. Thanks to my doctor, I can enjoy my life and family again. We hope that this presentation has given you a better understanding of the detailed and caring process that your surgeon and staff have undertaken to provide you with the best care possible. If you have any additional questions, please contact your surgeon. We wish you continued improvement and good health.